Hi. In the early 1990s, David and I moved to Streetsville, Ontario, and we began attending Streetsville United Church. That became our home church, our first home church, and Victor Shepherd, our first pastor. And I recall many sermons that meant a lot to me when, when I was attending there, but some of them specifically I thought would be useful to ex-witnesses, to former witnesses. Even at the time I thought, wow, ex-witnesses should hear this sermon. So I wanted to read to you one such sermon that I heard in, in the early 1990s that Victor Shepherd gave, and I have permission from him to read it to you. It's based on John 14, 6, the text that's, that says that Jesus is the way, the life. Okay, I'm, I'm going to misquote it. The way, the truth, and the life. So the, the sermon is called A Threefold Conversion. I will read you it in three parts, so it'll be three videos. This is the first part. Everyone is aware that words change meaning as they are used every day and bandied about. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, to be stoned is to have rocks hurled at oneself. According to street talk, however, to be stoned is to be intoxicated by marijuana. Only a few years ago, the word gay meant merry or lighthearted. Gay now has a meaning entirely unrelated to its previous meaning. What's more, the recent meaning of gay is so deep in the North American psyche that the word will be a long time recovering its original meaning. A similar change has befallen the word conversion. In scripture, the word means turning, specifically a turning to God. Today, however, the word refers to a psychological development, an emotional experience. Biblically, the word is associated with the human will. Today, it's association primarily with feeling. Biblically, conversion is entirely a response that God has equipped us to make and moved us to make. Today, the word refers to something we initiate out of our own resources. It's important that we recover the biblical meaning of the word conversion. It's even more important that we act upon our new understanding. This morning, then, I want us to probe together the significance of a threefold conversion. 1. In the first place, Conversion is a turning toward Jesus Christ. Before I say another word about our turning toward him, let me state as strongly as I can a truth that we must always keep before us. We can turn toward him only because in him God has first turned toward us. The simple fact of the incarnation of God coming among us in Jesus Christ demonstrates his turning toward us. Supremely in the cross, God has turned toward us. Having turned toward us, God will never turn away from us, never turn back from us, never turn his back on us, never abandon us, betray us, or quit on us. Facing us now, in Christ Jesus, God quickens in us the desire to turn and face Him. More than quicken in us the desire to turn toward Him, God fosters in us the capacity to turn toward Him. Having given us both the desire and the capacity to turn toward Him, God then invites us to do just that. There is no moment more crucial in the person's life than that moment when the invitation is heard and the summons is unmistakable and the fork in the road is undeniable. Everything hangs on this moment. 
Let us make no mistake. God has turned toward us in Christ Jesus inasmuch as he has nothing better to do. He has turned toward us precisely in order to have us to turn toward him. There is no more crucial or no more critical juncture than this. Our Lord himself says without hesitation or qualification, I am way, truth, and life. I alone am this. Way bespeaks road, pilgrimage, venture. It also bespeaks destination gained, arrival enjoyed, fulfillment guaranteed. Plainly, our Lord insists that his invitation, rejected, means meandering, staggering, stumbling, groping, everything we associate with losing one's way. Truth, capital T, in scripture means reality. To face Jesus Christ is to know reality. To keep company with him, to be soaked in the spirit that he pours forth, to live in that relationship with his Father to which he admits us, this is reality. It's obvious that his invitation rejected means to forfeit reality and to be left with illusion. Life bespeaks responsiveness, responsiveness not only to him, but also, as we shall see in a minute, responsiveness to others who have turned to face him, as well as responsiveness to those haven't yet turned. It's obvious that his invitation rejected leaves us with life spurned, life renounced, death. In view of the fact that everything that issues from our turning toward Jesus Christ in response to God, God's having turned towards us in Christ, in view of the fact that everything that issues from this is blessing, pure blessing, then how did conversion come to have such bad press? How did people come to associate it only with endless negativity? The word comes to have a negative connotation when the church loses confidence in Christ's ability to turn people to himself when the church feels that it has to do Christ's work for him and creates a point of contrast for him in others. The traditional point of contact has been guilt. Undeniably, there is guilt that is proper before God. That is there, that, that is, there is that for which people should feel guilty because they are guilty. And to be sure, our Lord knows what to do here and never fails to do it. Far removed from this situation, however, is artificial guilt that is worked up by assorted means of manipulation. Nothing has done more to discredit Christian proclamation than the psychological manipulation of people through, artificial, or through inducing artificial guilt. Such manipulation doesn't render the gospel credible. It may render a psychiatrist necessary, but it doesn't render the gospel credible. We should cheerfully acknowledge right here that Jesus Christ alone can render his truth credible. And if he couldn't, our slick machinations wouldn't help. Let's admit for once and for all that to believe in Jesus Christ is to trust him, to render compelling the truth that he himself is. Our emotional antics may amuse or distress other people. In no way do they render our Lord credible. The second reason conversion has a negative connotation is that it has been hijacked by those who want to capture it exclusively for a coming to faith that is as sudden as it is dramatic. People who saw the light in an instant, people for whom it all fell into place at once, 
these people have tended to say that unless discipleship begins as theirs began, it hasn't begun at all. This is not true. There are many ways of coming to faith, as there are ways of coming to be in love. To be sure, a few people, very few, fall in love at first sight. Far more people, most in fact, take much longer to conclude that they are in love. Most people come to be in love through a, a protracted process replete with hesitation, doubts, misgivings, as well as enthusiasms, ardor, and anguish. Nevertheless, one day they are overtaken by the awareness that they are indeed in love. Anyone who told them that they couldn't be in love, since they didn't fall in love instantly, would be dismissed with the wave-off he deserves. I have never doubted that some people, a few, come to faith suddenly and dramatically. I have only one request to make of these people, that they stop casting aspersion on those whose coming to faith has stolen over them as quietly, yet as surely as the dawn steals over a still dark world. How long it takes to come to be in love isn't important. How we come to be disciples isn't important. Only one thing matters, that we begin to turn toward him who has already turned wholly toward us. That we set out, however, however tentatively at first, on the road of discipleship. I'm going to link to uh, a, a video that I did um, based on C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity, uh, which talked about uh, do, J do JWs, or Jehovah's Witnesses, distinguish between begotten and created, or the Son of God and the Son of Man? So I'm going to link that to this one, and the next time we're going to be talking about conversion in the aspect of turning toward the church.